So I'm going to remove my bottle as well. I'm going to set my gloves aside so they don't get in the way. Try to keep your work area to which you're decanting the sample as clear as possible. Not a lot of clutter. That way you have plenty of room to work. So I've got my bottle out. I've got my bucket. What I want to do is make sure that I, when I look at my bucket, I'm going to see the weight of the bucket. I'm also going to see the lid has a weight as well. Those are going to be two weights that we're going to want to put on our fuel form. So now that I notice I've got those weights and I've put them onto the fuel form, now I'm looking for a total bucket weight. So I've got everything situated to go. I'm going to set it up on the scale. Let the volume of the bucket itself, the contents of the bucket, kind of sit there for a little bit. You may see the readings go back and forth, back and forth. That's the movement of the water. Once it finally comes to a, a stagnation to where it's not moving anymore, then that's the weight you want to look for. So I've got a good volume weight. I'm going to transcribe that onto my field form as well in section six where it says bucket, lid, and sample. What I'm going to want to do then is subtract the cow bucket weight and the cow lid weight from my total weight and that will give me my sample weight. So I've got it weighed. I've got my information put on my field form. I've set my bucket to, or my bottle to the right and I'm going to unloosen the cap of the bottle and have it to where I can just remove it. Make sure that when you take the cap of your bottle off that you turn it up, upwards. I was searching for the word there for a moment. To set it down like this, We'll put the screwing part of the bottle itself into a potential contact with the rim of this of this bottle itself, introducing some more contamination. So I've got my bottle to the point of where I want it, with the lid barely on there, and then I'm going to open my sample bucket. In opening the sample bucket, the one thing that you really want to do is all this pull towards you. And I'll tell you why. When you pull the sample lid off, if I'm pulling towards me, I'm pulling it away. I have the, the lid to kind of protect my arm. So if anything were to fall off of my arm, then it would fall onto the lid of the bucket. You want to be very, very careful. If I were to do it the opposite way and take it off like this, then you will see that my bare arm is going to come across the top of this bucket, introducing contamination once again. So what I want to do is I want to pull it towards me and I will set it aside. After I have the lid of the bucket off, then I want to do a visual inspection once again. Like I said in seminar or webinar number one, we never want to put our face over the top of the bucket. We want to turn it ever so slightly towards us, being careful not to flush the contents of the bucket, and look down in there for any sort of contamination. If it's floating, let it settle. If you have debris, in there and it's large debris, say whatever, leaf matter, dirt particles, let them settle before decanting. Never reach down in the bucket or the bottle to remove any sort of debris. So I've got my bucket ready to go. I'm going to remove my lid and I'm going to start the decanting process. For a heavier sample, you know, you can, you can act like a big shot maybe and say, well, I can handle this with one hand. Be very careful. I always try to support it with two hands. I want to have one hand on the handle of my bucket holding down the bucket uh, handle and then I want to cradle my other hand and support the other side. That way I'm always in full control of the bucket itself. If you do it one hand and something were to happen, you drop the bucket, you have nothing to hold, you know, to back you up. So I'm going to center, you know, right in the middle of the table I've looked at my contaminants. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to decant my sample. Never ever put the bucket itself in contact with the top of the lid of the bottle. What we want to do is we want to pour enough sample to where we're an inch from the top of the bottle itself. When we have done that and poured immediately, we want to cap it immediately like that. If you have extra water left over in your bucket, it's not necessary to do anything with it. If you want to do some research studies and use the water 
from the contents of the buckets, so be it. Makes for good uh, watering the plants. Uh, I use a lot of it to uh, water the plants in the office. So now we have our sample secure. We have the lid on real tight. Uh, we've had some problems, and we're doing some investigating, looking at some different bottles, uh, have a tendency to leak. But you also got to understand that these travel a lot of miles and get handled by UPS, Federal Express, and the mail. So if you've ever seen the commercial of the luggage that's handled by the gorilla on United Airlines, that's kind of the way sometimes the packages get handled. So uh, a little bit of leakage is nothing to be alarmed about. We are, uh, as a proactive type of a network, trying to always come up with the solutions so we don't have these reoccurrences. So I've emptied what's left in there. I'm going to put now my bucket as a used bucket. Uh, I don't know. The, qu the question is, can over-tightening cause leakage? I don't really know. I mean, there's only so far with the threads on the bottle and the inside cap of the lid, uh, only so far you can tighten this thing. And I mean, I've got it pretty tight. Uh, I just think a lot of times the pressure, uh, you know, and whether it be flown here or whether it be driven here, whether it be sat on its side, because when we get when we get samples in, a lot of times they're you know they're laying on their side and they're stacked up. So I don't know if the movement and the the pressure change, uh, if that has anything to do with it at all, may cause a little bit of leakage. You can see uh, that there is a little gap between there, but this lid is as tight as I can get it. So I've got my bucket. I'm going to set it aside. What I want to do with the used bucket now is to put it in my bag, and I'm going to set it in one of my shipping boxes. Once I set it, my bucket in there, it's not necessary to twist tie. I'm going to take a black marker, and I'm going to write on the bucket. We used to supply stickers that say used supplies. Now we just ask that you write used on the bag, put your bucket in there, and set it in your box. So that's no longer in the mix. Pardon me a minute, I've had a couple of, couple of problems with my microphone. Everybody still hear me okay? At this point, not necessarily any longer for the gloves. But I like to wear them all the way through the process of when you put them in the bag. So let's just say until we've got it locked up in our bag, we're going to keep the gloves on. We've got the bottle secure. Now it's going to come the time that we finish. The lid itself actually will go into a uh, a bag. You see how it come out of the slider bags, put them back in there, send those back to Cal as well. Question is, okay, I know that I went seven days without rain. I know that it did not rain, and if I look in this bucket, there is not one drop of water. How do I handle it? It still has to be handled the same way. These buckets have to come off no greater than 194 hours, which is eight days and two hours. So if you have a seven-day sample where the, it, there was absolutely no precipitation, that bucket still comes off of there. It still gets weighed. It still gets processed like it would. Uh, you'll submit a field form, but instead of submitting a bottle, what you're going to submit is a dry sample envelope. I'll talk a little bit more about that momentarily. But still, when you look in that bucket and you know it hasn't rained, be alert of any sort of contamination that that bucket may have in it. What should happen is you should it should open up. You should look in there. It should be clean as a whistle. But bird activities a lot of times on the sensors or what may cause the optical sensors and the incon collectors to open. Uh, bird can fly overhead. You can have some grass, whatever can blow into your sample. So even though you have a dry sample, be aware of any sort of contaminants in the bucket itself. Okay. Yes, uh, that is something that uh, I really haven't updated myself on the field audit sample. I know that uh, our QA person and uh, the affiliates out at USGS can answer that more. So uh, if you're involved in the webinar, so I don't sit here and give you a wrong answer. Okay. Uh, 
the way it works is if you don't have uh, rain for a week, then your field audit sample is poured into the bucket, uh, it sits for 24 hours, you decant it into the other bottle, fill out the field form and send it off. Uh, if I'm off center, then please comment Greg and Mark. Uh, we're part of the webinar right now and I'll try to uh, uh, give that information out before the end of the webinar. If for some reason I don't give you the answer you're looking for, please don't hesitate to email me or give me a call at the 800 number, 800-952-7353. So I've got this sample bottle all ready to go. I've got my bottle bag. What I want to do is I'm going to write down my site ID, my date off, my time off, and a contamination summary. Then with my barcodes, everybody should have a couple pages of these barcodes. On the left-hand side, it's going to say field form. On the right-hand side, it's going to say bottle, bag, or dry envelope. This one goes on the upper left-hand corner of the field form. As you completely fill out your field form, and you've got it all ready to ship off. The right-hand side is for your bottle bag. Put your barcode sticker on the bottom of the bottle bag. Do not put it on the bottle itself. If for some reason you don't have any precipitation and you're submitting a dry sample envelope, then there's a spot on the back of the dry sample envelope that says place barcode label here. That's where you put the one for the bottle bag. If you did not have any precipitation, you're sending off that envelope, that leaves you with an extra bottle. When you go to send in your used supplies, and you should send off your used supplies every time you get six used buckets and six used lids, and you have a spare bottle. If you want to keep one spare bottle around in case you make a mistake, that's suitable. Uh, if you go seven or eight weeks without having any precipitation, it means you have seven or eight extra bottles. We'd like to have those back, so ship those back when you ship your used supplies in. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put my bottle into my bag. What I also want to do in talking about the leaking problem is to make sure that I've sealed my bag as well. So any sort of leakage will get caught in there. As we've totally completed our field form, have everything filled out, our barcode in the upper left-hand corner, we want to tear it apart and keep the pink copy for ourselves. The pink copy, the records of the uh, field observer report forms for a site should be kept for one year. It's also very handy that if I, uh, if you have a problem or we have a data question, that I can call you up and say, please refer to 430, the sample that's 430 to 57. Also, what you're getting now with every sample, and you get 52 of these a year, is a sample receipt report form. That's not a report that says you've done anything wrong, and I'll show that momentarily as we do a review. It's just something to familiarize the operators with, hey, we got your sample. This is the data that we've entered. There'll be comments down below. If there is something wrong, like you left off a precip type or something like that, it's normally highlighted in yellow. We ask that you uh, take time to fill that out or respond to that. It's as good as gold. I mean, I've been associated with the project for over 26 years, and the guy that implemented this is our data manager named Tom Bergerhaus, and the sample receipt report form has gotten operators to answer almost as quickly as, the sam as we process the samples. So there's no uh, lagging and trying to get information from operators, and it allows us to process all the data uh, as quickly as possible. So now I have the pink copy for myself. I've got my barcodes on my field form. I've got my sample bottle. It's ready to go. I've got my field form. I'm going to grab my little box here that says deliver to NADP. I'm going to put a swatch of tape on one end. I'm going to wrap the field form around the bottle itself. Carefully putting it in, hold the flaps over, put a swatch of tape on it, and you have just processed a water sample or a rain sample for NADP. Cal address labels. We do supply the Cal address labels, but we do have pre-printed boxes. So 
if you're going to send us a sample box, try not to put it over the preprint. These people went to a lot of <laughs> work to uh, make this really handy dandy uh, preprinted box. So put your calligraph label on another side. Any questions at this juncture? I can take my gloves off. I'm done, and there's no way I'm going to compromise the sample with my dirty mitts. Any questions before we move on and review? I'll give everybody a moment. If for some reason uh, I don't cover something that you're really interested in or you would like to talk to me specifically and not through a computer for the webinar, as I say, and I'm going to say this again and again, don't hesitate to email me. My email address is at the top of every field form. Where it says email, it's ntn at ifws.illinois.edu or call me at the 800 number. It's 1-800-952-7353. We want to know uh, how do we quantify the debris that's in a sample. Make the best clarification that you can. I mean, what we see a lot of is uh, dirt particles, uh, leaves, twigs. Uh, if you've got dead bugs in there, that's, that speaks for itself. Uh, if you've got uh, the cloudy or discolored, you see that sometimes. If you've got the farmers in the field that are doing some spraying, you get the overspray. Bird droppings are, are obvious themselves. What's real important about bird droppings, though, is noticing, and I stress this again, notice what's in your sample when you first take it off the collector because that sort of sloshing around can make all that uh, diluted. And by the time you get it from, say, the collector back to the laboratory, the contamination may be gone. I'll just take a pad of paper and write down information that I may have uh, about the sample when I initially look at it. Any other questions? No. Uh, the question is, is it OK to weigh a frozen sample? Uh, the sample should be thawed completely at room temperature. As I discussed a little bit earlier, uh, weighing a frozen sample, uh, decanting a frozen sample, you may only decant part of what the true contaminants or the true components of the sample are. Uh, you may say, well, I had enough to fill up part of my bottle and I didn't have a whole lot of time. Well, that, that will invalidate the sample. Um, what you may get as part of your contaminants in what you poured the other part of the contaminants may be in the frozen part. So uh, we ask that it uh, thaw completely at room temperature. Uh, now, I, if you're going to, it's, uh, I would let it thaw completely before weighing it as well. I want to be consistent with what we're doing in the handling of the sample. Any other questions? Anything I didn't cover? Don't hesitate to type in. OK. Well, we spent the first 15 minutes with me on the screen, so now we're going to go to a, a little uh, different venue and do a review. If at any juncture during the review, uh, don't hesitate to ask questions as well. So it'll take a moment to load everything up. Uh, the completing the information on the shipping bag, I've, I've taped this shut. What we want, and I'll take the, the sample bag back out, we want everything that's on this shipping bag to be consistent with what you wrote for time on, time off, and site ID on your field form. So in essence, uh, Illinois 11 and uh, part of our presentation and the slides that I put together, Brian and I put together, will uh, answer that question for you as well. Bear with me for a moment. That's our first slide. Reminder once again, if this is the first time that you joined us for a webinar and you'd like to review it, uh, chances are if you review the same one, I'm, I'm just as poor uh, taped as I am live. So uh, you, can, you can watch it again. Just click on goillinois.edu forward slash NABP training. And then you can look at our other uh, 
webinars as well. Uh, we had one back in January about uh, sample uh, collecting the samples at both the Aerochem and the Incon Collector. Our second seminar was on the e on uh, data retrieval from the E gauges, the OT and the NOAA four, as well as the belt. Okay, sample decanting. Let's review. This first picture has got something wrong with it right off the bat, and it's not that LSU hat. I'm a big LSU fan. That is not the problem. The one real problem that I would say with that slide in particular is always try to keep your workbench as clear of unnecessary things as possible. There is just a form of something uh, that can be a contaminant. We want to make sure that we have an area clear that way we take the bucket off, we have the bottle, there's nothing around that's going to introduce any sort of contamination, so have your workbench as clear as possible. Next slide, please. Reviewing. Uh, I'm getting ready to pull the lid off of the sample. I'm going to pull it towards me instead of away from me. That way I don't introduce my arm to come over the opening of the bucket itself. Pull it towards me. I'm going to visually inspect the sample, turning it ever so slightly. I don't want to put my head over the top of the bucket. Uh, so I'm going to turn it ever so slightly towards me to visualize any contaminants that may still be in there. As I talked about, I'm going to hold down the handle of the bucket and I'm going to support it on the underneath side. That way I have two hands on it. Make sure that you do, never put the uh, rim of the bucket in, the con, in contact with the rim of the bottle. Uh, it may be tough to pour, but we're there again uh, introducing contamination. The minute you got your sample poured to an inch from the top of that bottle, screw that cap on immediately and try to screw it as tight as you can. The question was uh, asked earlier, is over tightening, is over tightening, uh, could that cause uh, leakage? That I don't have a, I don't have a scientific answer for that. That's maybe that's something that we want to look into, but I always thought uh, the tighter the better. I'm going to write all my information down on my bottle bag. You know, my site ID, date off, time off, and any sort of contaminant. Putting it in my bottle bag, my sample, straight down in. There's a copy of my bottle bag, just showing everything. Uh, the lower part of that has my uh, barcode. It's exclusively for my dry sample envelope or for my bottle bag. Once again, put the barcode on the, uh, the bag itself, not on the bottle. There's my fuel form completely filled out with my site ID, name, uh, dates, uh, operations, sample condition as we talked about. What you see initially may not be there when you get back to the lab. Make sure you make note of it. If it was there in the field but it's not there when you get back, I still want you to make the marks that you saw the contamination initially. Uh, all this fill out section six. Section 7 comes from your e-gauge. Section 8 is interesting. If you do not, if you open your bucket and you're unable to pour nothing into a bottle that you tried, that does not, you do not want to mark yes for bottle use. You have no idea how many people who say, it was a dry week, but I poured my sample. Well, there was nothing to pour. And in Section 9, uh, supplies. We ship supplies in our fly uh, or our buckets that we ship to and from the sites. When uh, a site sends back used buckets and lids, then if they're ordering supplies, then we put that as a request into our SAP database. And when we get a big box back in, uh, then that's where the uh, the new supplies will go. Uh, in an ideal world, and I'm not going to bring it up on screen, but you're Sample or your supply inventory should have 12 buckets, 12 bottles, and 12 lids. Uh, in a perfect world, six of those will be in transit as used. Six of them will be at site as new. Uh, when you get a new box of supplies, open it up immediately. Maybe you didn't order anything, but we may have decided to send you a memo. This is the time of year that we're going to be sending out barcode labels. Uh, a new set of barcode labels, as well as your NTN AeroChem lid seal. It's that time of year to change the lid seal as well. So uh, it should have a sticker on it that so says supplies enclosed. But if it falls off and you let it set it over in the corner, you may not notice it until you run out of 
uh, supplies from your previous box. So when you get them in, I'll just make sure that you open them up. This is that sample receipt report form. Basically, everything that you entered gets entered it by our data technician uh, before the sample is actually put into uh, the laboratory and decanted. Uh, as I said, you get one of these with every sample. Uh, a lot of times it won't have a darn thing on it, but there are times that if you left something off and that we need you to answer, then it'll be highlighted in yellow. You'll get those from uh, Teresa Ingersoll. Best way not to ever get any correspondences from our data technician is to completely fill out your field form and then she has nothing to email you back about. Keep the white copy, or send me the white copy, and you keep the pink copy. Wrap your white copy around your bottle. Put her in the old box. Got four flaps there. Fold them over, and the sample is off to the NADP at 2204 Griffith Drive, Doc B. Put your Cal address label, if you got one, on the opposite side of this uh, pre-printed box if you could. Any questions? You run out of supplies. If you're low on supplies, and as I show you the packing inventory, that pink label right there that you see, the fuchsia colored one, is basically an inventory that we ask you to do. Every time you ship off a box of used supplies with us, this inventory is going to ask for the date, the number of clean buckets you have, the number of clean bottles you have, the number of clean lids you have, and the number of large boxes you have. If you fill this out every six weeks, it really helps with our inventory. What you see in the yellow one is as you progress down through your box of unused or new supplies, you're going to get down to that second bucket from the end, and it's a yellow reminder that says, there are two weeks of supplies remaining in this box. If you've not received a fresh box of supplies, Please call Cal at 1-800-952-7353 or email us. Uh, this is also a good time to check your address labels, gloves, tapes, and other materials you may need for sampling. Any questions? Okay, you say, well, I did everything I was supposed to do at the Virgin Islands or in Colorado or in California or even at Bonville and here in Illinois. Where does my sample go? Most of the samples that we get, the big boxes and the and the samples themselves, come by UPS, Federal Express, or the mail. We have a distinct few that uh, use DHL as a carrier. We get shipments every day, normally between nine and noon. They're brought in on a cart, uh, processed by a shipping clerk. Uh, they're stacked up, and then they go on to the data technician. She enters all the data that you put on your field form as well as on your bottle bag and processes that. Sample preparation or how we go about filtering the sample. This first slide is a filtering apparatus. What happens is there will be a micron filter that's put at the bottom of this to the little white with the kind of the round circle in the middle. There's like a beaker that sits on top of this. What they do is they pour the sample in and then they open the a uh, vacuum that draws the sample down through the filter, and that's where we pick up any of the contaminants or measure the contaminants that uh, we process the sample with. This is a pH and conductivity station. Back in the day, operators used to be required to do their own pH and conductivity measurements at the field. That's long since gone away, but we still do them here at the Cal, and uh, that's the station for doing so. This is the FIA, it's a, called a flow injection analysis. It measures orthophosphates and ammonia. This is the IC, which is the ion chromatograph. This is a brand new piece of equipment. It measures chloride, sulfate, bromide, and nitrate. And this is the ICP, it's an inductively coupled plasma. It measures magnesium, potassium, calcium, and sodium. Once the samples are filtered, they're put into a cooler. This is just a picture of uh, some Airmon samples as part of the five uh, networks we have involved in NADP, but we uh, 
Once they're processed, then they're numbered and put into a cooler for storage. Bucket washing room, everything that you send in regardless. You can send us a box of stuff that says, I did not use any of these supplies. They're still going to get rewashed. We never take anything for granted. Uh, this used to be an operation with just one form of Fury washer, as you can see in the upper left-hand corner. Now we have two, uh, but we also have introduced a lot more uh, supplies or uh, used supplies to come in uh, because of the six-in-one boxes. Uh, this is a busy room for eight hours a day. Those machines are pretty much running uh, eight hours a day. We wash the buckets, bottles, and lids, and everything that we send to you folks. Once again, our packing supplies, make sure that you're aware of your inventory at all times. Uh, we don't want to run out of supplies. Uh, if for some reason that you run out of a, out of a uh, supplies, call me immediately. We'll try to quick ship you something. What invalidates the sample? Real quick, this is uh, any information that you didn't get. This is also going to be on the website, so you can go back and review what invalidates the sample. Real quick, you can read pouring leakage from the bag, pouring water from the dry side into the sample. If you've got if your collector malfunction and you got all your precipitation in that dry side bucket, and when you go to open that collector, do not decant what's in the dry side into the wet side to make a sample. Just make note that the uh, your entire sample was in the dry side and that we have problems and we'll talk. Samples greater than 194 hours, eight days, two hours. Bulk samples, no power to the collector. Normally a bulk sample would be something I ask you to put the collector in because of mechanical issues. Uh, basically, I ask you to put the lid over onto the dry side, disconnect the power, and until I can get you the proper components for what I think will fix the problem, we leave the uh, collector in bulk. Undefined samples are samples that are greater than six hours of excessive dry deposition. That rule varies with the new Incon collector. Uh, not letting, there again, not letting the sample thaw at room temperature. Reusing unclean buckets and field handling error. If you just spill a little bit, that's not going to invalidate a sample. If you trip over your own feet or whatever you may, uh, coming from the site and you spill an entire sample, that will invalidate the sample. Do's and don'ts. Always keep pink copy. Never put that fuel form inside the bottle bag because if it leaks, it makes mush out of it. Pour the entire sample so you get one inch from the top. Uh, you can uh, use the remaining sample for whatever you choose to use it for. It's great for watering plants. Let debris settle. Uh, if you open up your container and you see a whole bunch of debris in there, don't try to get it to one side or another. Just let it settle down and decan it uh, the way you normally would. Never mix or shake up the bucket contents. Shaking it around is not going to make it go away, and if it does, you know, that's taking away from what we're really trying to accomplish here, letting us know. Uh, always make notes in the remarks section of the field form. You don't have to write a novel, but you are our eyes at the site and at the laboratory, so if something's going wrong uh, that we need to know about or that you feel concerned about, don't hesitate to write it in the remarks section. I read every one of these field forms. And lastly, all this call the cow. If you have any questions, I'm kind of new at this, uh, so if you ever have any questions, comments, needs, wants, desires, give me a call. Uh, it's a learning process not only for me, but for the operator as well. I like to get and talk to people uh, and familiarize myself. I want to I want to be user friendly. So if you ever have any comments or anything you need, don't hesitate to uh, give that phone number a call. If I don't answer right away. I have caller ID. I'll call you pretty much back probably within a half hour. This is the NADP staff. We have five programs within the NADP staff. Uh, I was told I should probably throw some pictures in here, so I didn't want to leave anybody out, so this is the whole shooting match. Uh, we have the network, which is the NTN network, the air monitoring network, AirMon it's called. That's a daily precipitation monitoring network. We have AMON, which is a new passive ammonia. Uh, we have uh, MDN, which is a mercury deposition network. And we have AMNET, which is an atmospheric mercury network. And those are the five networks within the NADP. Any questions, comments? Once again, if you did not get an opportunity to watch one of the previous uh, webinars that we had, uh, click on this goillinois.edu forward slash NADP training, and 
you can view the others and review this one if you uh, if I missed anything. Like I said, don't hesitate to call if I did. Now, it, uh, the question is, is it necessary to twist tie the bags when returning the used bucket? The answer is no, it is not necessary to do that. Any other questions or comments? We're looking for July as our next webinar. We're going to talk about electronic safety. I just completed my final exam in a course last night called Electricity and Electronics. So I guess they're going to throw me to the wolves to see if I really learned anything. And uh, so in sometime in July, we'll have another uh, webinar in our continuing series uh, entitled Safety. Any questions? Well, on behalf of all of you that are associated with NADP, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy day and joining us. I hope this was insightful and you learned something. Uh, always be aware of the validity of the samples and that your efforts are so much appreciated. We could not do this without the operators and the agents in the network. I'd like to thank Brian Kirshner. Uh, he doesn't get much uh, camera view, but he doesn't need it. He does all the work. I just stand up here and act like I know what I'm doing, and hopefully I fooled a few of you. But uh, thank you for all that he did, and uh, like I said, if there's anything that you ever need, don't hesitate to call.